Um, we have for you today uh, several individuals that are going to be talking about our experience and also providing answers to questions that you have on infrastructure design. Um, let me go forward to this real quick. Um, I want to point out real quick, we do have two microphones. I'm going to ask that you go to the microphone to ask a question. It'll help us get through the questions. And I do have some preloaded questions that people have sent us in advance of this uh, particular session. So here's, here's a little bit of an overview of what we're going to do. Um, I've got a short number of slides to set the stage so you understand a little bit of the background on what the VCDX methodology is, some of the stuff that we're testing, and then we'll get into the panel discussion where we'll actually cover a number of different topic areas. Um, once again, it's up to you to help us guide uh, the questions and the answers that we'll cover uh, during the session, but we'll have some to actually help lead into that. So we're going to cover the value prop, some of the infra infrastructure design methodology, um, we'll do the panel discussion and then some next steps that we recommend if you're looking at going forward and achieving VCDX or in general becoming an infrastructure architect or a systems design uh, architect. Uh, my name is John Arashid. I'm going to point out the individuals here. I'll let you read the details. I've got Michael, Mustafa, Mark, and Chris. We've got our uh, uh, Twitter handles on here as well. My expectation is that in this audience we have a mix of different roles uh, including aspiring architects, uh, experienced architects, and administrators. There may be a few other individuals out there that are working in different roles, but somehow touch onto uh, infrastructure design. So first, the value prop that we look at on the VCGX program. There's a couple of things that we really are looking for when we, when we uh, go through the process of evaluating uh, an individual that's going through the design defense. We're looking at their ability to look at a design, develop solutions, um, look at their judgment on how they make their choices, and also the, the technique that they use on developing design patterns, operational patterns, evaluation uh, considerations, and so on. We also run through two specific scenarios. Uh, one scenario type is a design scenario. Another type is a troubleshooting scenario. This is where we test how an architect starts a design process with the customer in a very short window. What are the questions they ask? How do they start initially developing a starting point for the design? We also do the troubleshooting, and many people ask us, why, why do you test on troubleshooting? It's because we do get support at VMware and other companies that are represented all in this audience around where a problem is. Is it in the design itself? Is it in the deployment? Is it in the, the uh, steps that may come afterwards in the operations or the changes that happen? We're going to cover a little bit on the uh, design methodology. There's, <coughs> there's four different phases that we look at. There's a discovery phase where we identify the inputs. We call this the logical design area or the, con sorry, the conceptual design area. We then develop a solution that is at the logical design area. This is where we can have further discussions with a customer or a business unit about the project to see if what our concepts are match what they believe that they would like to have uh, achieved. And once we have that completed, we can move to a physical design, and that's where we're getting the architecture developed. This is the engineering uh, aspect. And the very final stage is the validation. This should be pretty common knowledge for most people. This is pretty much a standard process you do in a lot of different things uh, in the work environment that you have. But the one thing to think about is, during a course of time, from year to year, or some other time period, Technology changes, best practices changes, uh, change, they evolve, and these are things that you have to consider. <clears throat> when we look at the methodology and we look at what an individual provides, there's three, I'll call this the, the high level concepts that we look at. You need to be able to support uh, business cr uh, requirements, business critical applications, uh, and a managed environment. And these are the things that we think are fundamental at the VCDX level. At the VCAP design level or the other design levels, for example, on the uh, network virtualization uh, uh, area, we may uh, uh, look at a few other things as well as, as we go through that process. So let's look at a couple of uh, the three perspectives. Um, conceptual model, this is the owner's viewpoint. This is where you get your requirements. Are they always requirements that can be implemented? There's a question of yes or no in many cases. Sometimes somebody may ask for seven nines of availability, but do not have a budget to support something like that. How many people here have to support seven nines of availability? 
Yeah, I didn't think so. I don't see any hands. Good. So I oh, I got one. So good luck, buddy. And I, I can I can probably <laughs> guess where you're at. There's a cost associated. But anyways, the, when when asked about things like that, they might come back and say, "Well, that's because we want to have the best availability possible." We're not looking for people who are going to try to choose something that's the maximum opportunity. Yes, you could do that. But in many cases, the simpler designs that meet the requirements for the project are the most important aspects. Don't include the kitchen sink, per se. We'll, we'll cover that a little bit more about that later on. Can I just say something, yes. John? Yep. Uh, for the guy that has to support seven nines, come and see me a little bit later. I've got a signed book for you, Virtualizing SQL Server, Doing It Right, signed by me and the other two co-authors. Because yep. I feel for you, man, seven nines. That's cool. <laughs> So logical design, this is where the architect comes in. This is where they look at the concepts that the owner has, the, the stakeholder has, and how do they think about concepts above the actual vendor technology or the configurations. This furthers the discussion with uh, partners, other team members, uh, the stakeholders. Um, and so we consider this the engineering uh, design aspect without choosing those specific technologies. Now, the last phase is the physical design, and this is where we say, hey, how do we build this? How do we do the deployment? We need to know what vendor technologies we're going to use, the makes and model of particular hardware or even software, um, and maybe the configuration uh, details as well. So I'm going to review. There's the perspectives that we look at. There's the methodology I talked about already with that circular slide, the four Ds for uh, discovering the inputs, developing the solution, designing the architecture, and determining success. But I also want to um, step into another area. I'm going to pass this over to Chris. And this is actually looking at how do we do the alignment? What are the areas that we test for? And even if you're not going for the VCDX, if you are doing a design, I think you'll find some value in looking at this and thinking about that when you create your design. I'll leave it to Chris. Thanks, John. Regardless of whether you're going for the BCDX, like he said, when you're an architect, when you're an expert, and you're helping somebody with design, it's critical that you have a framework that you're going to apply to the process. You saw a life cycle that he put up there earlier. But that life cycle doesn't mean anything if you don't have something that's going to drive you through that life cycle and be consistent through the life cycle. So I'm not <laughs> suggesting you go out and get ITIL or Zachman or TOGAF or find one of those frameworks. It doesn't have to be that, as long as you buy into something that will be consistent throughout the process. When it comes to VMware, we look at specific design areas. And we look at these design areas at two levels. The first level is the overall architecture. The solution that you provide as an expert, does it address availability, manageability, performance, recoverability, security, risk management? And all of you guys can find a very common theme or definition for those. But you have to start the process with the customer so that everybody's on a realistic page as to what those really mean, right? Somebody just wanted seven nines. So you talk about availability. How many of you have been with customers where, hey, we need five nines, and as you get into the discussion and they realize cost, the next question is, well, how about nine fives? <laughs> <laughs> it, it changes, right? The, the, the reality of it changes, but you have to have the definition of these design <laughs> qualities in order to make sure that the deliverables are going to be exactly what's expected by the customer. So when you look at these for design consideration, design choice, design pattern, justification impact, and risk management, that's for the overall solution that you're providing. Go to the next one. But you can take those same design qualities and then look at how technology is used in order to achieve those design qualities. What products are there? What features are there to address availability? Are they used properly? You discussed recoverability at a high level for the solution with RPOs and, RP and RTOs. How aggressive do I want to be? How conservative do I want to be based upon the environment? But then how did you implement technology to solve that problem? Was it a third-party product? Was it a VMware product? Our VMware VCDX, our design methodology, is not just about specific VMware solutions. It's about building a solution based on customer requirements to address these things that the customer wants. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to give you a quick overview also on the VCDX program. When we actually do testing, it's roughly three hours to four hours. It depends on which test that you're taking. And if you're doing it uh, in a English-speaking country versus a non-English-speaking country, we have some flexibility in how we actually present the, um, uh, the defense. 
But the first part is 75 minutes, uh, typically for the, the majority of the, uh, the uh, defenses, and that is presentation of your design and defense of your design. We'll, we will ask you questions for clarity, for uh, identifying areas where we <coughs> identify problems that we need you to explain and maybe correct. Um, we want you to provide the best possible design that you can before you come in. Correcting it in the defense is possible, but it's not the best solution. If you can do it beforehand, that is much better. So review with other individuals. We cover the two design scenarios that I talked about before as well. For preparation, you want to improve those weak areas. You want to understand all aspects of the design. So people know me for the cloud because of the work that I've done. I mean, Mustafa might be for storage. Chris might be for networking. Mark for desktop. Michael's actually covered pretty much all of the, the gamut as well. The gap, uh, maybe. Huh? Big apps. Big apps. Monster yeah, VMs. big apps. Yeah, monster VMs. Um, when we do our design, we typically work with other architects, other administrators, business owners, business developers. There's the concept of DevOps that fits into that play as well, where we're thinking about how do we actually eliminate silos so that we can be more successful on what we're creating. Um, if you did not understand, for example, the storage area in your design and your question on it, and you cannot answer the questions, specifically around your design, then you ha don't have the scoring opportunities that can help you be successful on passing or scoring as high as possible. Um, we're looking also at what components you include. If there are non-essential items that are not needed in there, why include them? Um, looking at being clear on the solution. Avoiding ambiguity. We've had uh, the case where one individual came in for a VCD, VCDX defense. They put up a giant poster, and they had pretty much every possible solution there is for this customer's project. And we asked, well, which one did you use for the customer? Well, I gave you all these solution areas. You picked the answer. I think you uh, had yeah, a actually, good example the poster, on that. I had to have a magnifying glass standing close to it to be able to read yeah. the text that shows you how, how tiny the text is and the, the diagram was huge. Yep. So we tried to drill down onto actually what choice did he make. He kept going back to the, uh, the chart. So we told him, what did you give to the customer? Mm -hmm. He didn't have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. It's practically was just giving us, this is like a shopping uh, a wish list. Yeah. So at some point, once that, that set of uh, possible avenues are, are taken or, or uh, provided, they, that person should have still worked with the customer to determine what was the path that was a fit or the best fit for that particular situation. Um, the other thing is looking at developing study and peer groups. If you, aren't, uh, if you are a, an aspiring architect, you haven't worked on a very large design, think about other individuals that you could work on with that design. The idea is take multiple skills. If you're creating a fictional design or a partially fictitious design, you need to bring those other skills in, but you also need to understand why those choices were made in those design uh, areas. The other thing that I would um, definitely recommend is conducting mock defenses. I've got some, uh, a list of some references uh, later on, but on almost every VMworld, I think we've offered VCDX boot camps. These are also done by VMware user groups. These are another way of working with other people, going through the process and understanding both the design aspects as well as the defense aspects. I'll let you go ahead and jump in on this last one. Yeah, so don't <laughs> implement technology for the sake of technology. As, as both an architect and or a VCDX candidate, if the customer asks, you know, why are we doing this? Well, man. Haven't you seen a demo? It's so cool. <laughs> <coughs> this has happened. That, that's not a reason to implement a technology. You have to have business justification to do something. Otherwise, you're increasing complexity. You're, you're adjusting operations, right? Day two operations now need to change because there's features and technologies that didn't need to be there in the first place. So there's, there's something as, a, as an architect or as an expert that I think is a very important quality to have. How many people have heard the customer's always right? Everybody should put their hand in retail, okay? Yeah. How many of you in the back of your head at some point have said, this customer's not right? <laughs> Everybody yeah. should still have their hand up, okay? <laughs> Listen, when you, when you provide a design to a customer, there are constraints that you have to work within. And ultimately, the solution you deliver them may not be the one you really wanted to deliver. 
So there's an important key to this. You have to document that. This is your CYA, okay? <clears throat> because if something happens in the design, and it was your design, and it's not noted that I suggested an alternative to the customer, and they signed off on it, then who's accountable for that? Mm -hmm. Is it you? Is it the customer? If you can provide the justifications, I did this because the customer wanted within this constraint, but here's what I would do differently to mitigate a risk that's been identified by that design. Guess what happens now if the failure occurs, and they go back to the design and see, hey, Derek told me I should have done this differently. <laughs> he looks really good at that point. Right? He's now a trusted advisor for anything moving forward because if we would have listened to him in the first place, this wouldn't have happened. So mitigate risks, justify your design decisions, and don't implement technology for the sake of technology. You've got a good story about that too. Yeah, there's, there's one, uh, this is going back a few years, but do people still remember vMotion before we had st storage vMotion? I do, I think there's a lot of nodding heads there. And people understand that distance can introduce latency. So I had a particular customer who had a distance of about 26 miles, roughly, almost 30 miles, between the two data centers. And they said, well, we've just acquired this optical uh, metropolitan uh, network. It's one gigabit. There's a redundant one gigabit link between these two sites. And we actually got justification for this by saying, we are going to implement vMotion. We have to have it between these two sites. So that should be raising some eyebrows already. And when I started discussing with this individual and talking about, well, there are some challenges here, they did not want to listen. They say, you know, somebody's going to get fired if we don't put this in the design. I go, but we don't support it. It's like, it doesn't matter. It has to go in the design. I go, okay, well, I have to put in the document that, hey, there's, there's a problem here. And it's not supported. There, if you don't have a problem now, I guarantee you will have one, especially if you introduce voice over IP, for example. And of course, a few months later, they implemented and they had a problem. And the problem was they had introduced voice over IP and immediately, boom, nothing worked. Think about it. I have a virtual machine at this one site. The storage is local. I V motion to this other site 26 miles away, but the customer is still here. So the request goes over to the other site and there's a back and forth with the storage on all the things related to the VM, the operating system, and so on. And that introduces a much higher overhead. It depends on the application, of course, but when you have hundreds of VMs doing that over a one gig link, and vMotion is supposed to have one gig mm -hmm. by itself guaranteed, there's a problem. So when this problem came up, I said, hey, turn to page 37. <laughs> We've signed off on this. I reviewed this. It's all in red. I gave them a printed copy, all in red, because I knew this was going to be a problem. And that alleviated my problem. It was a CYA. I did my best. I don't ever want to get in that situation, but the customer was adamant. We have to do this. We're moving forward. You can't change this. Just get the design done. And so we were successful in getting them to change their, um, their mind later on of recognizing, don't do this. And then storage vMotion fortunately came out a few months after that, which actually alleviated some of those problems. Yeah, that was well and before stretch clusters were actually available and supported. Yes. So that no longer exists. Yeah. So from my perspective, uh, one of the other major reasons not to implement the technology just for the sake of doing so, adding three or four different <coughs> additional software or hardware uh, packages or instances, uh, I mean, what does that do to your free time that we all have during our 40-hour work week, right? Uh, you now have an additional four products to, to upgrade and uh, patch and go through compliance checks and PCI if necessary. Um, I mean, not adding those technologies until you require them uh, can really save a lot of time for, for most of us who uh, sit behind a desk and manage an infrastructure uh, and manage those environments. So from the operational side, not implementing it frees up a lot of your time and then also reduces your complexity when, you're, when you do run into an issue, when you do hit a trouble. You have to do validation. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, I would like to also add that <clears throat> sometimes customers' constraints means that they are imposing certain facts on you. Uh, may limit your choices f to meet their business requirements. So, for example, a customer that will tell you, we only have a limited number of uh, network ports, so your design cannot allow more than one network connection per host. But I'm going to give you 10 gig E. <laughs> so, that's the single point of failure there. You lose that link, the whole 
host is gone, depending on what kind of technology implemented on the, in the virtual environment, uh, you're going to end up in uh, events that are unnecessary that could have been avoided. For example, HA may take up to five minutes or more, depending on the size of the virtual machine, and the customer tells you, no, I want to have five nights. Right. So five nodes is not just availability across sites or uh, between uh, between hosts available to the VMs on the same host. You try to keep it on that host as as long as you can and avoid any uh, any downtime. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the video that says I'm an expert. I can do anything. <laughs> have you seen Go that? Go see it if the you have seven it. perpendicular <laughs> lines. I think there's a big misconception that uh, you should just throw every VMware product at a design, and that's a big mistake to make. So just because it's a VMware VCDX doesn't mean you should use all of the VMware products. You should only use the products that you really need to use. You need to know what the others are and know why you didn't use them, but otherwise you're just increasing your attack surface, and it's much easier for us to find weak areas in a design, and it's got to be based on business justifications. One of the things I see the most common that gets implemented with weak justifications is a stretch cluster environment because it's cool. And I admit I like stretch clusters. They are cool. But I'm not going to implement one unless there's a really good business justification for it. Let me add one more yep. thing to that along the lines of non-VMware. If you've been to the key, you've had your eye on VMware for a long time, you know that we are no longer just a hypervisor company. We're doing a lot more than that. With the release of the VCDX for network virtualization, it's actually possible to present a design of KVM running on Ubuntu with NSX multi-hypervisor and OpenStack. Yeah. It, it yeah. doesn't have to be VMware. We want to certify architects. We want to certify mm -hmm. people who can provide solutions within the constraints that customers have and meet their requirements. But you must use VNX. Right? <laughs> so but you do that, have to have more than one NIC per server. So, so although well, that depends the, on failure domain. Yeah, yeah. If my failure domain is multiple racks, true, and yeah. I have a cost constraint, and I want to have the leanest possible solution, I might not care that I've only got one HBA port and one NIC port, because yeah. I can lose a rack and my application can still keep running. Yeah. You need to look uh, at all the different cattle. technologies that you are putting together and really identify. Simplicity ensures much better success. In many cases, when you add the additional items, it's not that we don't want you to use other technologies, but right size your design, right size the technologies that you're going to use to actually fit in that design. Okay. When we look at the different design areas that we talked about before, we had mentioned, uh, I think we covered some of these in the, in the one slide. I'll repeat them one more time. Assumptions, requirements, constraints, budget, timelines, other factors you know, that may drive a design solution. I'm showing, I'm showing four that are influenced in the uh, design areas, but I'm sure there are other ones that people can come up with. The idea here is you are going to have to think about how each of these decisions that you make can affect other areas of the design or the design project. You choose one technology, it could reduce the uh, cost, but it might increase, increase some other area. You know, there's, there's positive and negative effects. Sometimes you have double positives or double negatives. The idea is you have to think about that as you go through that process. Um, what we want to do right now is go into the panel discussion. That was kind of giving you the background and a framework for this discussion so we can avoid some of the common questions that we do get on architecture design from, from the VCDX perspective. We'll stay, still take questions on that. All of us are VCDX, but we all have different areas of experience. Um, and, and different representations of organizations and companies. Um, what I would like to do is I'll put up a, a set of questions that we had in advance, but at any point anyone has a question, I'll jump to that and we'll use the questions that I have up as, I'll call them fillers or lead-ins as we go forward. Um, because, so we have one microphone on the left and one microphone on the right, I should say, in these, I don't know. Hopefully you guys can see them. <laughs> I don't know how to point them out otherwise. Um, so the first one I'm actually going to ask to uh, this panel is how does the long-term vision of software-defined data center impact your design today? Who would like to go first? I can start. Uh, yeah. So uh, the long-term vision, depending on what we are planning for future uh, products and future uh, 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 additional capabilities, uh, depending on what you want to do, you can prepare. If, if you know what it's going to require, you can prepare environment f 
from now so that in the future you don't have to rip and replace or you don't have to redesign it. So for example, if you're going to use, you plan to use virtual volumes, you, once you understand what virtual volume requires, effectively what you have right now should allow you to use virtual volume provided that you're going to use a uh, storage that's on the HCL, you're going to be using uh, the software components that provide the feature. So for, for now, the, the actual infrastructure would just require the connectivity and the compute. Once you add the storage in the future, providing the software component, it will provide you the feature. If you want to think of more modular design with, uh, uh, that doesn't require the, the capabilities of like virtual volumes, you can use something like hyper-converged uh, storage, uh, like uh, Nutanix or like Evo Rail. Uh, uh, Evo Rail provides you with the, the building blocks that you grow in number of nodes, and as you grow, it just scales uh, outwards, but it has a limitation of how many, uh, how many hosts would, uh, would it grow to. So you need to think of what is your target growth uh, 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 requirements. Uh, it's not just a matter of calculating how many uh, IOPS you're going to need and how much compute you're going to need and how much capacity you're going to need. You need to think of X number of years from now where I'm going to be. If you're planning to expand different sites, then you need to think of a, uh, the, the infrastructure that would allow you to have the availability across sites or if your users are going to access your environment from anywhere on any of these sites, then you need to think of uh, the components that would allow you to have the uh, non necessary replication, but you can have, uh, uh, we have host based replication, we have third party vendors that provide a very ex fairly expensive uh, methods of replication or mirroring or, uh, or, or otherwise. You may not have to have the actual shared storage. You may have uh, your application designed in a way that you have several application servers and you have your database servers, and the database server is the one that's actually copied across the network to provide the, pre the, the same, uh, um, uh, uh, same set of database, same, same records uh, to the other applications that are accessible from the locally, uh, this, uh, cl closer distance for, to the users. Uh, what is that called? Geographical locality. proximity or yeah, locality? Locality. Yeah. locality? So I think Mustafa's covered a whole lot of areas, but all of those areas are glued together by one thing, and whoever gets that one thing is going to get a signed copy of my book. So go up to the mic, the first one to say what the one thing that's gluing all of that together, that's the most important thing going forward as part of the SDDC vision, in my opinion anyway, and probably Chris's too. Um, so who's going to guess that? Quick. <laughs> There's one person going up. Hurry up, hurry. <laughs> Let's see if we get it right. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the uh, network virtualization. It's the network, absolutely. Yeah. Well done, Thank give you. them a clap. Yeah. Come up and get your book. <laughs> so I think the thing that's changing the most when it comes to the SDDC, and we heard announcements about this this morning, is really the network. <laughs> Network virtualization, but network topologies as well. We've got cross-center vMotion. We've got cross-virtual switch vMotion. We've got long-distance vMotion. We've got hyper-converged architectures. Everything that's changing at the moment is changing in the network. Uh, Micro-segmentation, uh, stretch cluster environments, um, tunneling, um, you know, all of that stuff. Now, if anything is going to change and you need to account for that in your SDDC vision, it's going to be around the network. Chris? Yeah, so, you know, if I, was, if I was designing something today and the customer said, well, you know, we're not really ready to go to software-defined networking yet, but we know that we want to get there, there's a lot of impact on the design, starting with the physical network. We want to get away from the traditional three-tier core ag distribution model. We, we really like spine leaf. We want to route everything. Now, if you've been working with vSphere for a while, you're like, well, wait a minute, he just said route everything, but we're not supposed to route vMotion, right? vMotion should be layer two. How many of you know we can route vMotion? You can route vMotion. Now everybody knows. How many, right? how, many, how many know that we now can route iSCSI? Yeah. Now how many know you can route iSCSI? Yeah. Five, five. There you go. <laughs> right? yeah. so, so you can make design decisions today. If I'm looking at the data center, all right, well, I'm going to go with the spine leaf model. You know what? I don't have... NSX, I don't have logical switching and distributed logical routing. I don't have automation yet, but I don't want to have to rebuild this data center when I get to that point. 
So I, I might not be leveraging the scalability of a spine leaf architecture. I might not be distributing my layer two and reducing my VLAN boundary now, but those are easier changes to make than redesigning the entire physical infrastructure when you do start to implement NSX. You're, you're, and you know, if we move into the, the logical space now, your vNetwork distributed switch design, you can prep that today in anticipation of having NSX and make things easier as you, as you move forward with software-defined networking. And some of, the, some of the things that I find that are really great around that, the uh, software-defined data center, it's really about policy-based management, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're standard vSwitch or distributed vSwitch, ready for NSX or not, you're still going out and manually making these configuration changes. You're including that in your, your maintenance guides, the design guides, calling out the different networks uh, and the different security settings that you have out there. Uh, and as we start moving towards a software-defined model, uh, it's really about defining a policy and then applying that type of policy out. Um, regardless of if it's uh, storage performance and the tiers of different uh, disk and the, the IOPS and the performance or replication that we have. If it's from the network, whether we allow inbound access, outbound access, uh, or even a, a level of service associated with any of the network traffic that we have out there. So really, when you start from my perspective, I'm looking at and I'm looking at policy-based management of all the components that, that comprise my data center. Uh, a lot more work on the front end from my perspective, but a lot of a huge payback as I start to maintain and own the solution as the administrator uh, moving forward. So Yeah, defined by software, implemented and improved in the hardware as well. So it's the full stack being completely integrated together. Absolutely. Now just on the leaf spine uh, network architecture, I've got a bit of an extreme home lab. Oh, home Lab Extreme Edition. That's so I've actually got Leaf Spine Architecture in my home lab. So if you want to look up my blog at longwhitecloud.com, that gives you an idea of what I've got in my home lab. And talking about policies, going forward, you're going to notice that uh, VMware sto uh, software defined storage is heavily tied into policies. So the way it is in vSAN, and it would be in, in vVol, and so on. So it would simplify the, the design and the management once you identified your uh, uh, policies that you want to implement. And depending on the storage vendor, they will provide different capabilities for different policies, so you will design your policies based on those. Software defined is one of the most important things. Right. And because software is everywhere. Even if you look at your hardware today, most of that is software defined. I mean, it, firmware has been a software for ages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's where everything's going to. You can set a policy at a high level and it can get applied all the way down to the switches and the ASICs and everything like that, all automatically. You define something once and it's always applied consistently and in compliance with your policies. Now, we have another question that's actually uh, related okay. and it's on how does network virtualization and storage virtualization change infrastructure design? So it's a little bit of an extension to that first question, I think. Who wants to tackle so that? Yeah, you know, for, the, for the networking piece, like I said, physically, there are things you can do to prepare uh, on the virtual side, but probably the most uh, important thing to prepare for is the cultural change in your organization. There's today, without network virtualization, there's a very clear demarcation point between the vSphere admin and the network admin. How many are vSphere admins? Put your hands down. How many are network admins? Let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> Look, NSX, <laughs> NSX is eliminating that demarcation point. We are now abstracting services that lived in the physical world into the virtual world. And the question that I'm getting the most from very large organizations is, who's going to do this? Who should I expect to manage this? So for the vSphere admin, there's this deer in headlights of, what am I doing? I've never had to deal with firewall and ARP requests and ARP replies, and this dude's talking packet walks, and I was lost at step one. It's new to the vSphere admin. The other side is the network administrator. Deer in headlights for a totally different reason. Where's my job going? <laughs> hey, the network guys. You guys have been asking for a long time for a static, stable, reliable network, right? You don't like it when every new department or every new project or every new hint at something wants a new subnet. You guys don't like that because there's a lot of VLANs to manage. There's things you have to do. We're taking them away from you. Let me repeat that. 
We're taking them away from you. So a lot of the network guys are like, whoa, whoa, whoa you know, I don't, I'm not sure that we're ready for this SDN thing yet. Because what's going to happen? Right? Their role is being diminished. So with NSX, since I came to VMware in January, part of my role has been to create a career path in network virtualization. And that's been by bringing vSphere administrators together with traditional network administrators to figure out the pain points and ultimately figure out how are we going to get along? How are we going to bring these two job roles together to create something new that does not exist today? And that's a network virtualization administrator. Somebody who can bridge the gap between physical and virtual. That's something that if you're looking at SDN for now, for six months, for 12 months, you have to be thinking about the operational impact of SDN. Let's also cover on the storage side. Yeah, on the storage, it's the same approach, the same metaphor. Uh, bringing the storage administration into the virtual environment because the software defined. So, for example, in, instead of having, you having to submit a request to create a LUN, you just go and create the virtual machine and the virtual volume for it will get created. And where it gets placed on the storage depends on the policy they assigned to that specific virtual machine. If you want it to give it high availability, you want to give it high performance, it will go on the right type of media. And how does the array knows that? Because they talk the API that we designed and they implement it. So you, uh, the storage administrator practically is going to be managing the physical storage regardless of, uh, they're not going to have much of a, uh, uh, an, uh, an effort or an influence to actually manage what is on the, uh, uh, configured on the storage. All they do, they provide the resources and you consume the resources. So if you think about what you've, you've just heard, there's a combination of the SDDC that we talked about in the first question, and if you hear what's happening, there's the networking and the storage that are really becoming more of a foundation for the SDDC versus just the compute. You need the compute, but the big change is, I think, in combining those two new concepts. Yeah. Right, and, and the management. So, and, the, and the way I see it is uh, we all have network groups and storage groups and vSphere groups and Windows groups. Seeing those groups uh, as we're moving forward to the software-defined world, um, those groups blend. I mean, Chris brings it out beautifully as he shows that we're having to bridge that gap on the network and virtualization space and blend and create a new role. Um, Mustafa says the same for, for the storage side. And uh, if we continue working in just those isolated silos and uh, we never look forward, we'll still we'll have a lot, a lot of trouble getting to that software-defined world. When we start to work together and break those boundaries of the traditional siloed IT environment, we're going to be able to, to move forward, be agile, and adopt those, those policy-based management tools much quicker and much easier. Yeah. Right, and the dynamic nature of software-defined network, software-defined storage makes it a lot simpler for you to uh, uh, be f uh, il flexible and elastic regarding uh, where you place the, the, the virtual machines, uh, whether on the network or where you place them on the storage. If a virtual machine uh, IO requirement drops, you can change the policy and automatically just move to a lower tier storage. If you want to place a virtual machine in one location and you want to transfer to another location that has a different network, how are we going to maintain the network for the virtual machine? Uh, you know, uh, uh, software defined network allows you to, mint, to keep that by creating that uh, stretch um, a VLAN or a uh, tunnel between the sites. Doing this with the hardware implementation is very cumbersome and requires a lot of changes and a lot of uh, advanced yeah. planning. Let's go to the question over here. Yeah, so with the changing of the roles, have you seen in any company start adopting this widely with the NSX and the virtual SAN where the definition is coming from Everything's policy-based, right? So your network engineers that have always been doing your physical are starting to define those virtual policies. And the same thing with your SAN engineers, they're defining those policies. So you're not really replacing their job, you're extending their job, mm -hmm. because now they're not only responsible for the physical infrastructure of those technologies, but now they're responsible for determining the policy. So now they have to get more involved on the compute side so that they understand how those policies are going to be used later, or are you really seeing it where 
it's going to become an entirely different role, which will diminish the physical networking or the physical SAN role. And you're going to have, uh, instead of three departments, you're going to have, uh, you know, five. You'll have virtual networking, networking, virtual storage, and storage, and then you'll have your standard virtual compute. Yeah, so Good let, me question, you, yeah. Let, me, let me give you a, a little anecdotal story here. Um, you're right. They do have to define the policy. But we're talking about defining a policy how many times, right? The whole goal of SDDC is to define your policy, attach it to some object, and let that policy move with the object. So if I can get my network guy, if I can get my security gal to define my policies and then leverage the intelligence of SDDC, once that policy is defined, it's defined. Now, every time we come up with a new application profile, you're right, we're going to have to do that. So, correct, it could be a shifting of their job role into more of a, I'm a policy definer as opposed to, I'm at the CLI. Because when you adopt Spine Leaf and you adopt NSX, the concept of I have to go trunk VLANs daily is gone. That's a good thing. It's a bad thing if that was your only job, right? <laughs> So, it evolves. But, but you brought up the important part, right? Is that as an organization, you have to figure out that shifting job role so that you can get the network administrator to realize you're not trying to kill them off. You're, you're trying to bring them into this transition of software-defined networking by saying, yeah, that part of your job is going to get easier, but you're going to continue to do this part of the job in order to make SDN successful in our SDDC. Yeah, the same thing goes for uh, software-defined storage. It's a good opportunity for the same admins to learn virtualization so that they can manage the storage from within the virtual environment. They don't have to give up their job. They can just shift to a, a broader spectrum that gives them control over additional resources that was out of their control before. In the past, all they do is say, I have a cookie cutter, learn standard size, I assign it to you, you do whatever you want with it. Does it suit you? Does it provide the required, uh, requ uh, I mean, the requirements? No. So it makes your life easier and makes their life easier and provides uh, that uh, crossover where you don't have to worry about the, the capabilities because the SAN admin can give you all, you, all what you want because it's already, you already defined the policy. Let me, let me do this. I'll go ahead. We've got a couple more people with some questions. Cool. Yeah. This one's a little bit of a strategy question. So. Uh, I understand NSX today, um, say we had data center A and data center B, and we had BMA and BMB, uh, so one at data center A, one at data center B. We Where's A and B? Three, layer three link between different them. Sites. Uh, so they're different sites. So okay. we want to have a layer two adjacency between BMA, which is in data center A, and BMB, which is in data center B. So I know we can accomplish that with VXLAN, but the interesting question is local egress and then local ingress. I know force routing we can solve for local egress, but local ingress is something that today, my understanding is we have to use something like Lisp from Cisco or any other competitor solution. Is there a plan to maybe use technologies like AirWatch or the uh, Layer 2 VPN extension and maybe extend um, to branch offices? Because the challenge is if we have a third office um, and they're trying to access that VM from a routing standpoint via BGP or OSPF, they can't really tell which data center the VM's in, so they have to take a single path in and cross the DCI. So I had your answer at data center A, data center B. <laughs> my, my, my first response when you said that was, damn you, Keynote. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, we can do those things today, right? We can go A to B. Right now, it takes some duct tape and stuff to get it going. But we understand the vision of customers and their desire to do those things. And you said it right. It's extremely challenging right now to manage that ingress across multiple sites. And to answer your other question, yes, there is a plan. And no, I'm not going to tell you it. <laughs> okay, you must but be it, patient. Listen, you know. All of the large customers want that, right? I mean, isn't that the holy grail of availability and disaster avoidance, right? VMware's been pretty good at delivering the next holy grail. Stay tuned. Okay, okay. thank yeah. you. Yeah. Next one, yes. 
So ever since I was a kid, um, I've always loved technology and performance. Ever since I was able to get enough RAM to be able to run Doom on my PC, I got hooked on the idea of tuning and performance and architecture. As I've evolved in my job right now, I've noticed that I'm becoming more five miles wide and 10 inches deep in the area that I'm in working for an energy company. And I've chosen over the last couple of years to focus more and more on VMware and all of the different technologies they have, but I'm finding it becoming more of a challenge to match that with where I do my daily responsibilities now because I touch networking stuff and storage stuff and other things that are, that are still hardware physical components in our infrastructure. So really my question is for people who you see go through the program and they become certified as architects, where do you see a lot of them falling out into different roles in companies? Is it more managed service providers or consultants or maybe just architects for large organizations? And It, it runs the gamut. Yeah. So let me call out some of the, the, the roles that people have currently as they've achieved the VCGX and some of the areas that they might be moving into. We have, and you guys can raise your hands here, networking. And if you are a VCGX in the audience, because I know you guys, you, I see a few that are out there, just raise your hand just so we know, you know that you're in there. So I see one networking, two, three. So we've got a few VCGXs that are represented in the audience on that. Um, Storage is another area. I, you don't have to raise your hands for all of them, but, but the other thing that I, if I look at, those are categories based on technology. We have consultants and architects. Those seem to be the obvious ones initially. Um, I think system administrators who want to learn more, they actually want to improve their environment, or they want to actually start moving into an architect role, this is one of the ways that they can do it. We've had a few VCGXs who um, really wanted to move into architecture design, but the company they were in was very big, they were told, you know, I'm sorry, we already have enough architects, we can't support you. They chose to actually pay for it themselves. They completed that. Um, some individuals stayed within their own, uh, their own company. Others took on roles in other companies. I, I'm not saying you should do one or the other. Sure. It's just personal choice there. Um, we have people in support organizations. Mustafa is a great example of that. He worked on a real design to actually help solve a problem and that's one of the things that he used as he went through the process. We have SEs. We actually have a few sales people who wanted to understand when they're selling a technology, how does this actually get implemented? They may have had an SE, but they themselves wanted to make sure that they could be, as a salesperson, as best as you can, be a trusted advisor. And yes, they have a goal to sell something, but do they truly understand the process? What are the requirements? Don't lead with the technology lead with asking the questions that you do in what's called a discovery phase to identify what those, those areas are. We've seen project managers, uh, we've seen product managers at some of the partners choose to go through this process. So that's some of those, some of those areas. I think you want to do Well, that. so you're, you're talking personally, right? I mean, sure. career is a very personal yeah. thing. Yeah, sure. And you started this whole thing about when you were a little kid, right? Now you're not a little kid, right? You're a grown man. So, <laughs> I think so. I can't, can't bigger choice, I right? Can't see with <laughs> my wife would say I'm still a kid. But. If, if, you're, if you're still a kid, your voice is very deep for a kid. I can't see uh, But th the point is this, right? You like the performance tuning. You like those things sure. that you said. So figure <clears throat> out, if I got my VCDX, how do I put myself in a position to get the job I want? Not to look for a specific job. I, I got my VCDX, and when I did, I was actually a VMware certified instructor. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching forever. There's people in this room that I've taught. Everywhere I go, there's people that I've taught for years. I didn't need my VCDX. True. I wanted my VCDX because I wanted opportunities to go out and do other things. And when I did that, my job focus, I mean, I was working for myself, but my job focus, my boss isn't very nice, but <laughs> my, it, it changed, right? Because I went from being an instructor pretty much full time to I could teach when I wanted to teach, and then I could go out and I'd work with customers. And, and I had that flexibility to pick the engagements that I wanted to do because I went and, and you know, did the VCDX and proved that I could be an expert in that. So it's not a matter of what, you know, what's out there for me to go do. Do it and then go find what you want to do as an expert and market yourself the way that you want. You know, search for the job that says, look, I'm, I'm an expert you and can I can anything. focus on performance <laughs> tuning, right? Sure. So it, yeah. it, it I'm an expert. I can do anything. It, it opens the door to work on projects that you wouldn't be able to have otherwise. I mean, th th I think we've all experienced this in some way or another. There's probably a dozen stories we can come up with. But honestly, it does make a difference. When I go and I work with a customer when I'm doing design work, I haven't done that recently, but um, when I was doing this as a VCGX, and I said, hey, 
I think the dis discussion that we have around these business requirements needs to have somebody from finance. And in particular, let's get the CFO in, or maybe also the CTO or the CIO. To my knowledge, no VCDX who has asked that, and we don't ask it all the time, but no VCDX has ever been turned down on that request. There may be, I mean, there might be some individuals that just say, oh, you're cutting too high up in the, uh, in the food chain. But if there is a valid reason and you justify that, then it's very likely you can actually open that door. So it's opening the doors to projects and opening the doors within companies at different levels we all work with the administrators, the managers, all the way up to the executive level as a VCGX. And is that true for the other VCGXs out in the audience? Do you see the same thing? I'm seeing yes here, yep. yes in the back, yes, okay. I can give a great example because you might have noticed I don't talk the same as these other guys. So I'm from, hey. New, I'm from New Zealand. <laughs> so that's the southern England, yeah. the one that's down yeah. in the South Pacific. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm actually part of the global R&D team for a Silicon Valley startup, Nutanix, which you may, may not have heard. And um, I'm the only person in the country that's employed by Nutanix, and I do performance engineering and solutions architecture for them. And I attribute that largely to getting VCDX because I don't think I would have been noticed if I didn't have VCDX. And it allows me to work from home in a beautiful country, which you've all seen on Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, <laughs> and work for a Silicon Valley company. And I just can't think of anything that's better than that, to be honest. There's your new performance guy once he gets his VCDX. There yeah. you go. <laughs> it just cool. really, it's, it'll, it'll open up the doors for you. It'll give you that, uh, that credibility. And whatever really interests you, you have a, an additional uh, uh, badge of honor that you can take with you. And uh, I mean, you'll be judged by your peers as you get that. And this is a tough bunch to get through. Yeah, but our yeah. goal is to pass. It's not to fail. Sure. We don't lower the bar. Even though we're increasing the number of VCDX, the reason why that's happening is the more VCDX we have, just like in the Cisco program, the more testing we can do, the more mentoring we can do, the more training we can do. When we only had a small number, so you've got one in number two here, we only had a really small number of people. And so to scale out was much more difficult. We're working with partners and we're working with even customers to help fill out the staff that actually can actually do the testing. I love scale out, John. Yes. Well, oh, yeah. 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 Now, I so want to go to, I, would, I, I think we like have, I would like to add something yeah. quickly. Yeah. Going through the process second. certification will help you get used to a structure so that in any, uh, uh, any uh, uh, activities you do in your career, regardless if it's going to be in virtualization or something else, you learn the structure. How do you start from the beginning? Don't jump to the middle of the, uh, of the, the design or the architecture. Okay. Let me take the question over here. I think this is going to be the last one, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about next steps. If we still have time at the end, we'll take some additional questions. Yes? So uh, my question is about uh, network virtualization and uh, I, I think uh, in my opinion like network guys job are not going away they still need physical network but now their job is either extending or reducing uh, extending if because they need to now learn how to do the same access layer and distribution layer stuff in VMware instead of doing in the actual switches so now they have to learn two different ways of doing the same things. My question is, I mean, is VMware thinking about somehow giving one management interface even to manage the physical stuff? So that, I mean, jobs of network guys are not becoming more complex from learning perspective, learning two different ways of doing same things. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna give you a couple answers here. As far as the network administrator learning stuff. We know that. Uh, I, I ran an NSX Ninja program for five months where we had CCIEs, CCNPs, VCDXs, VCPs, vSphere guys, Cisco guys, all in there. And we picked their brains about what is the impact on you? How do we create a career path, certification, training that bridges this gap, right? Like I talked about earlier. So the courses that are available from VMware, there's an, a, an NSX install configure managed course, like our traditional courses, which is geared towards a vSphere admin. That course is gonna cover routing and switching basics, because the vSphere admin hasn't had to deal with OSPF and BGP and things like that. But then we're also coming out with an NSX fast track. The NSX fast track is going to be geared towards the network engineer. And now we're going to talk about hypervisors and VM kernels and distributed switchings, because we realized what the skills gaps were from these two indiv individuals, and now we're trying to bridge that gap. 
right? So you're right, their jobs aren't going away. We don't want them to go away. We want to bring them into the network virtualization space. Uh, I did a session yesterday, I don't know if anybody saw it, but when it comes to network virtualization certification, we're actually trying to attract the network administrator into this new career path. So horizontally, if you were a CCNA or a CCNP, you are actually allowed to go take the VCP network virtualization with no class requirements. We're rewarding your experience on the physical side. Go learn the virtual side and you can get into this career path. At the next level, if you're a CCIE with no time constraint on this, you can take the VCIX, which is a new exam, the VMware Certified Implementation Expert, with no prerequisites. We want those guys to come into this space. Also, it's not just about Cisco. There are other networking certifications that we will accept, but clearly they have a lot of professionals, right? So along those lines, the next question is about manageability, right? How many different switch vendors are there? A lot. We are more than willing to work with all of them. All of them. <laughs> Come on. All of them. Not almost. Yeah. Okay. One more time. All of them. <laughs> the love loss here is one way. We will run our product all day long on top of Cisco, and we will love it just as much as if we ran it on Dell Cumulus or Arista or anybody else. That's another bridge that we have to cross because everybody's asking for that. This is all great, but where's my single pane of glass to manage? So there are some tools from an operational standpoint or from uh, the ability to capture information about physical and virtual, but we understand that there needs to be some type of centralized management for both physical and networking. Uh, it just requires a lot of effort from many different organizations to try and make that happen. Including the partners. Yeah. Yes, including the partners, right? So it's it's we you know we have to be able to get to their APIs, right, and or the other way around in order to give us that ability to truly manage everything but one place. But there there are tools. I mean, if you look at tools like EMC Smarts or GigaOM, and there's a couple others that are really starting to come around on giving you that that centralized operational control on physical and virtual. I got one more piece of feedback and then I'm going to have to finish the last slide. That's cool. so, go ahead. so one thing I want to say is that clearly you've learned from the keynote today that software defined needs hardware. And software defined when packaged with hardware equals more simple. And I like stuff that's simple. So what's going to happen is the networking job at the physical layer might become more simple, but then we have to make more decisions around the policy layer. But we still need the hardware to be really reliable, super fast, and flexible to run a software defined data center. So what I want to do is close out with just one other slide. And this is talking about next steps. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I think Chris, I'm going to let you go through the first one. Sure. And we'll actually kind of go through the other ones. We'll take some turns on giving some feedback. So, you know, right now, more than ever, if you want to go through this process of being an expert or even just going to do a design for an organization, uh, the guy who asked the question earlier said it, it's, you know, you want to focus on VMware. Well, that used to be pretty easy to focus on VMware. Now it's where Product within space. VMware yeah. am I going to focus, right? And so that's part of this. You have to identify, am I going to be that networking expert? Am I going to be the compute expert? Am I going to be the cloud automation expert? Or am I going to be the desktop expert? So you have to identify the scope of where you want to be in that expertise. Now, and, the long-term yeah. vision clearly is mm -hmm. software-defined data center architect, right? Now, I, I am by no means telling you something like that is coming, but when you yeah. put those four <laughs> pillars together, right, that's kind of what you get. Yeah. And, and moving forward into the future, when organizations look to somebody to say, lead me into the SDDC, there's got to be somebody who understands all of those. There's got to be somebody in the room who, who exactly. gets together with the storage and the networking and the cloud and pulls them together and says, yeah. guys, let's build this together. So we, we've talked about, you know, the different components that are built together to, to construct an infrastructure. Infrastructure is big. The analogy that I, that I have up here is, if you're focusing on a product design, it doesn't matter what the product is, think of that as building a house. There's a lot of complexity in it, but it is a certain size. When you start building an entire infrastructure, there's a lot more technologies, a lot more vendors. Yes, converged infrastructure and hyper-converged infrastructure is coming into play, but there is also integration with other areas in that space, in, in, around that space. So that's why we look at designing a city as a comparison for the infrastructure. Other things that I'll cover and we'll finish off here is uh, decide on a methodology that you want to use for infrastructure design. You can use the BCDX methodology. That is one way. 
Um, there's a, there, I'm going to show you uh, some references on how you can actually get some more information on that. Um, the other thing to think about is going through the certification process. Even if you don't finish, going through the steps to learn the methodology and practicing it, reverse engineering, for example, and, and IT infrastructure you already have, that's a great way to learn. Come up with your own design based on the infrastructure you have. You might have to get permission depending on what group you work in. Sometimes government agencies don't like that. But, uh, but think about what you can do to start practicing this. Talk to other people that are in that same skill space. What I'm going to do is leave you also with some resources. This is the last slide. We've got some web references on the certification program, VCDX, the hands-on labs. Uh, I want to call out the VCAP and the VCDX boot camps. Some of the people in the audience here I saw at the boot camps that we did just on Saturday. Um, I am going to try to offer them in Barcelona for those who are going to Europe if you missed it here in the US. Um, there's also a brand new class that is launching September 15th uh, called the VCDX Fast Track. Half of this uh, role, about 40% is covering the methodology. Another 40% is going through the tools that an architect would use. It may not be the same ones that you might use in your organization, but they are tools nonetheless to help you understand how to do the discovery phase, develop design considerations, and basically present a design that matches, uh, sorry, present on your design to somebody, whether it's a VCDX panel or somebody else, to understand that area. And then the other areas that I talk about are the product, what's it? Sorry, I only have three more sentences. Yeah. We have a thousand people we gotta get in here. Okay. I'll let you guys read it. Thank you guys very much for coming in. Thank you. Thanks Thank, so you. Much. Thank you. Thank you.